Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 160 of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. And we have a great show for you today. Oh, so you've read the outline. I just, you know, it's, that's true every time. I just thought I'd say it. Y yes. Well, you think the downloads of this episode will now be like triple what they usually are because of your sales pitch? <laughs> when the episode goes viral, yeah. All right, should we dive into work in progress? Yes, let's do that. So I've noticed a trend where people are not just the director of things, they're the executive director of things. This is so good. This is so good. Have you noticed that or is it just me? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if I've noticed the trend per se. Uh, I do know, notice that like people are executive directors. <laughs> But you think this has been going on for just, like, there's no uptick. This is just me finally, like, observing something that's been there. I don't know. I could, you know, there could be, they say that, you know, there's, like, inflation going on, you know, in the economy. There could, this could be, like, oh. director inflation, you know. Right. Yeah, so I'm the director of the center, and the acronym is CHEER, and I'm, you know, and and. I don't know actually who even approves the title or how I would do this. Wait, but... let me ask you this, though. Has anyone come to you and be like, oh, so you're the director. So then who's the executive director? No, but they should. <laughs> they should be asking me that. They're like, no one's in charge. Right. <laughs> and and what do you think the difference is between those two roles? Well, I don't know. I know in, like, in industry, for example, in like the data science industry, at least, um, there is like a specific role that's called like director. Okay. Uh, and it's kind of like a, my understanding, I could be totally wrong, so, but I, my understanding is that it's kind of like, like a very senior mid, mid management level. Okay. Like the next level up would be in the, in the more of the, in the kind of leadership of the company type of role. So the executive thing does mean something in this context. Perhaps. Yes. I don't think they, the, ironically, I don't, they don't use the phrase executive director. I don't think in industry. Well, the other thing that's weird is like my sense is like culturally that academia would cringe at the term executive. Yeah. I mean, traditional academia. Probably. But maybe that's maybe that is a shift. Yeah. I think the other thing that I've seen back going back to academic settings is that um, sometimes like a large center or a large institute will have an academic as its like leader. But then there will be like a person who is kind of in the org chart, like below that other, that leader, who is the executive director. And often that person is like not, or is not technically, is not really, really like an academic. Like they may have an academic kind of background with like PhD or something like that, but they're uh -huh. not like a practicing academic, but their job is to kind of, op kind of be like the chief operating officer of the Institute. Okay. Uh, and to kind of make sure it runs well. Um, whereas the nominal leader is like, is an academic who's like a professor or something like that. And which one is the director and which one is the executive director? <laughs> well, I think in that case, if I recall correctly. Because let me tell you, I'm not changing my title if it makes me the lower, per, you know. <laughs> Why like... Well, that's the thing you got to be careful for, about, right? Is that you don't want a demotion. <laughs> right. Well, I'm a little worried about that now. I'm trying to think of like what the, in that, in that situation, what is the leader called? And um, I can't remember now. Um, let me try to find one of these centers and see if I can dig one up. <laughs> this is an important. This is important for your career, really. I'm really worried about your career. You should be. And you're. Are you looking it up now on the fly? I'm or looking it up right here. And... Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's so funny. Um... So the, yeah. So the leadership person is the is the director of this, at least this institute that I'm looking at. And that's the person who's the ac academic. Is like the, the academic kind of overarching, yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know what to say about that. We should just table that. You're going to stay director? Is that what you're going to do? Yeah, I'm a little worried. It might be a demotion. Plus I'm, yeah. plus I'm worried. I don't know the channels I need to go through. Or do I need to go through channels? Can I just change my e-signature? I think you can. I think these titles are fungible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should maybe you should be the executive professor of biostatistics. <laughs> okay, you know what? We're going to have I'm going to we're going to have to research this a little bit more, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, so I love it when I bring up a topic that you raise your hand to go research. Yeah, I'm going to look at all the centers that I'm aware of and see how their okay. what their org chart looks like. <laughs> okay. Cuz you're looking out after my career. And I will uh, we will we will return to this in the next episode 
and we will discuss the future of your career. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm looking forward no to that, problem. I think. <laughs> All right, pet peeves. Go ahead. Be my guest. Writing by committee on Zoom. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I, like, I don't even know if anything more needs to be said about that. Well, why don't you describe what you're talking about? Because I think people might have more than one thing in mind. Yes, that may be true. So let's just use, let's take the first part of that phrase, which is writing by committee. And we talked about this a few episodes ago, how there are different ways to do it. One way that just does not work with my style of sort of writing is to actually literally write something together in the group. And what I mean by that is like, you know, if you got in the same room and you both were like hammering out the introduction to a manuscript together or multiple people were doing that. Like I need to either be the lead writer and then circulate the document and then get feedback from people and then incorporate it or have someone else lead it and then send me the document and I will provide feedback. And you as the executive author can, <laughs> you know, decide what to keep or not keep, right? That 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 I can deal with. And and part of it is is that oftentimes people will ask questions when you're writing by committee, like, do you think we should include this or not? Well, I mean, it depends on kind of what the whole document looks like. And I may have an opinion now that it shouldn't be included. But then when I see things together, I'm like, no, we should include it. So you're being asked sort of things about the writing that I need to just go hole up and think through the document myself, right, before I can give some sort of cogent opinion about it. So the writing by committee on Zoom is that Zoom, I think, has facilitated this phenomenon because you can screen share, right? And you can have someone, the executive author, driving the Zoom and doing the editing as people are looking at things. And oftentimes when this has happened to me and they say, well, what do you think about this paragraph? I'm like, well, can I, can I come back to you in 20 minutes? Like, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to go, you know, pour myself a Diet Coke and then I'm going to think about it. And then I'm going to be like, oh, let me look on PubMed for a second and and then I'll come back with something cogent. But I can't really respond in a helpful way on the fly. Yeah. And the other way just wastes everyone's time. Right. I mean, is this making any sense to you or is am I an outlier here? No, I think, well, there's two issues. One, I think, is that Zoom has you know, kind of made it easier to just convene the committee, you know, um, because like you don't have to get people in a room. And, and so I think it's just made it easier to do that. And so that's maybe why it's happening more often. Right. And then the other thing is just that it's just what it comes down to is just the lack of leadership. Right. It's just uh, someone has to be identified as the executive author, as you would say. Right. We have a title for this episode <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. And I think um for various reasons, sometimes people are unwilling to do that or to assume that role or, um, you know, to identify that person. And uh, and that's too bad, I guess. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. I can't, that said, so I have some experience <laughs> along these lines. Usually it doesn't happen like we're starting with a blank page and we're going to write this from scratch. Like, I, I've never been in that situation Oh, I have. Yeah. I mean, that's a fair point. I haven't been in that situation so much, but I have been in the situation where suddenly there's like, you know, two paragraphs in front of you on Zoom and people are like, so what do you think about this? And maybe like it's a sign of being an introvert. Like, I just want to say, OK, let's cancel this meeting. And can you send me the document and I will use this time <laughs> right. to look at the document. So I think the issue is that I, I have been in situations where, like, I know for a fact that if we walk away from this Zoom meeting, nothing will get done, <laughs> right? So it's almost like I need to hold everyone hostage so that we can write these two paragraphs and then never think about them ever again. So let me ask you this. So if it requires that, is it really necessary or worth doing? Probably. Not. So, yeah, so that's the irony. Probably not. <laughs> like, probably <laughs> just as easy would be the problem is that it would be just as easy for one person to just walk away and just write whatever. Right. Right. And then 
and it, it would probably be fine. But choosing that one person is the then you just move the goalpost to like who's going to be that one person. And again, it's like if there's no clear leader, then there's no like executive author who could be like you do it or I'll do it. So the other thing that's required for that scenario to emerge is none of the people in the group are thinking to themselves, oh, this will just be much easier if I raise my hand for this and there'll be fewer meetings. Right. And it's not going to be that much more work. Like nobody was like that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I guess I'm not saying that, I I guess it's never the case where this is the best case scenario (laughs) where where you're like sitting in a Zoom meeting and collectively writing whatever, however many paragraphs. Um, But it it might be one of those things where it's like the, the the best worst option or something like that you know it's the best yeah. of all bad options <laughs> i mean what is a like the only worst option which may not be worse is just not doing it right yeah so not doing it is the is the final option but and i think it usually is the worst because i think in this kind of situation usually you're like 80 percent or 85 percent of the way there and and you're trying to get over that last 10 15 percent and for whatever reason, it's like maybe you probably because you've put off like the hard parts until the very end. And now like at the end, we're here at the end. It's like the only hard parts to deal with. Well, my goal is to avoid that this scenario. <laughs> but what do you do if you're not the executive? Off- Let's say you're it's clear. Like maybe we don't know who the executive offer is, but we know it's not you. Right. Right. So this is this has happened to me not over Zoom, but where it's writing by committee it's not clear who the executive author is, except for I know I don't want to be that person. And I'm thinking that I'm not expected to be the person, at least from like how the, pro- you know, how the project came to be. And in that situation, um, I have had to put aside my own kind of like, you know, this is insane. Like there's a group meeting yeah. and we're having a discussion without a leader about who's writing what there's no authorship decided. Right. And eventually an executive author emerged, uh, but you just sort of have to sit by the sidelines. And I think if you're not sure what you are supposed to be doing, then if you send enough emails or like, well, you know, what's needed from me when someone will eventually raise their hand for the executive author role but then the whole document will come together and then then they're sort of like, oh, we don't really know what author, what order the author should be in. Like, so I just go along with the flow, but to deal with my own issues of like thinking this is crazy and disorganized, which the, the main issues for me is like I've sort of blo- mapped out all of my work and if people is are experiencing expecting something for me that's not articulated because there's no executive author like okay you're going to write 1500 words and you're going to send it to us in two days that's my anxiety is that when there's no executive author there's some unspoken expectation of me that i'm not really aware of or that's going to like crop up out of the blue yeah and it's going to upend you know my week and and you're going to show up at some meeting and they'll be like elizabeth where's your 15 pages exactly (laughs) But any, I think you just have to go with the flow and then to manage my own anxiety, I will, if I'm unclear, I'll just send an email to the group that I'm like, you know, the danger of asking what's needed from you is that people could say, oh, could you be the executive author? Right. <laughs> just, you know, you have to be careful. That's true. You do have to, yeah. You have to have a your uh, finger on the pulse of what's happening. Right. Yeah. All right. Should we go to Roger's Leadership Academy? Sure. At some point, you know, we should hand out certificates for people who've completed the curriculum. Well, <laughs> we have to determine what that means. To, to, um, That's true. As I mentioned, well, I guess it was like two episodes ago. This did come up in an independent setting and it was suggested as curriculum for some sort of coursework. Maybe we could create like an online course. That would be awesome. <laughs> And then you know you get little certificates with our names on them. Right, right. Yeah. So we have so we have two new sort of um, learning objectives for a segment on the online course. <laughs> yes, yes. From this episode, so the first first one is this is really key. The whole point of taking on a new job and a new leadership position is you get 
a bunch of resources that you can spend on yourself and you can go on a big giant spending spree. Yes. So when you start your leadership position, spend all the money as quickly as possible and make sure you spend it on all of your own pet projects and don't worry about a financial sustainability plan. Totally. That's, that is a, a well-worn leadership lesson. Yes. Because you can always bail out on the leadership position and go to the next leadership position when you run out of money. Exactly. And, 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 and here's the thing. When you go to that next leadership position after having blown all your money on whatever, they'll be like, wow, <laughs> you really made a huge investment in that institution. Look what you accomplished. Because you got no more money left, right? And they'll give you twice as much. The shocking thing is when I've seen this happen and then the person like lay, like moves up the academic ladder. Totally. Like to me, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I think it'd be the exception if they did it. <laughs> right? Right. That's, that's an important learning objective. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, it's, it is kind of stuck. I can think of a number of specific individuals <laughs> who I won't name on this podcast. Um, who have exe- executed the strategy like multiple times <laughs> in different places. Right, right. And and have only ended up better off. To be now, can I add a serious note to this though? Maybe. Because you know, usually we're not serious. But sometimes it's hard to tell, and that's kind of the point, right? Yes. Especially pe- people like me, um, one of the problems that I have is that I have a problem spending money. And and by that what I mean is I have a problem which is that I don't spend money, <laughs> right? Like, I my inclination is to save money. For the most part, that's bad because, like, no one gave you money to save it, right? <laughs> like, the point is they want you to do something, right? Right. And so, and, and the money that you save is not, like, gaining interest or anything, right? Like, you're not going to have more money later because you saved it, right? So the point is you, you, you do want to invest it in whatever you're doing at your institution with your research or whatever, right? And so I think that's been one of my weaknesses is like, I, you know, I'm like less inclined to spend money once I've got it, you know? And I, so I think that like, so if you go to one of these leadership positions and then they give you a bunch of money, like they do expect you to spend it. They don't expect you to hang on to it <laughs> or like save it for a rainy day, right? Right, um, right. And so the question is, well, what do you spend it on? And that's something we can debate. Um, but I think, Spending it is expected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The point, the key thing here is spending it on all of your pet projects and don't worry about a financial sustainability. For sure. No, financial sustainability is the next person's problem, right? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Number two, you have to start at the place of of knowing that everyone is out to screw you over. Uh Is this the, the the paranoid style of leadership? Yes, because, you know, everyone is out to get you. So make sure all of your behaviors and actions are informed by this understanding. Your job is not actually to be helpful to anybody, right? Your job is to protect your, you know, your dowry from everyone. (laughs) And to play people off against each other. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That's a that's a key. That is a key lesson. I can't say I don't know as many examples of that to be honest that's a it's a really rare and exquisitely rare leadership phenotype characteristic (laughs) but let me tell you if if it's so rare that it'll just launch you i mean you might be the president or the chancellor yeah be careful it's like it's extremely powerful (laughs) yes You, you might become president before you know it yeah Right, right. <laughs> no, because like the first one, I was like, that's like the first one of, that you mentioned about like spending all your money on a pet product. That's practically a tradition. Like that's like the norm, right? Right. Um, but this one is, I think, is a little bit more. Uh, it's, it's a little dark. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, more rare. I think you may enjoy Roger, Rogers Leadership Academy even more than any of our listeners. What, what do you mean? I, I think this is your favorite segment, right? Because I populate it with stuff. Totally. I have to do very little work. <laughs> Right. Well, this goes back to, and I think it's sort of, you know, it's the highlight of when we're recording is you chewing on these, you know, Rogers Leadership Academy lessons. It's been great. I I think this is a great segment. I've learned a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And and there's just an endless stream of content. That's the other good thing. Any good podcast segment 
just like generates its own content on its own, right? Uh, so you yeah. look at podcasts that like you know follow the news or you know like they that's an effortless scenario because like news is always happening, right? And uh, right. and this is so I'm always on the lookout for a podcast segment that just kind of like writes itself. And this is a segment that writes itself. Unending material. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. All right. Lessons from space and golf. Do you want to do space first? Sure. Uh, I only uh, so recently. I think last week uh, the uh, planetary decadal came out, and we've actually talked about related topics. So there. A little while ago, there was the astronomy decadal. Oh yes, cert, which is like a like a study for like what to do in the next ten years, right? Right. Yes. And so, so I guess there's another one for planetary science. Okay. Can I ask a really, really naive question? Yes. So this implies that planetary science is different than astronomy. Yeah, at at like a nuts and bolts level. So I think the astronomy decadal is more about like what are the instruments that we should build to to collect observations about like outer space, basically. Okay. What what it comes down to is telescopes, right? Okay. Whereas the planetary decadal is more about, it seems like it's more about exploration. So for example, like the previous decadals have come up, you know, all the Mars rovers that we have have come out of those decadals or like uh, spacecraft that go to outer planets and things like that. Um, They come from, that's from the planetary science side. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's just my limited understanding. It's not like I do this, right? (laughs) Right. And is there like a new, I mean, the lesson before was about kind of setting an agenda for a scientific area, you know, that's like a big giant agenda that, you know, needs large amounts of funding for the next 10 years. So this is the same thing here, but for planetary exploration. Yeah. And, you know, the lesson really, well, first of all, I'm always, I'm always struck by the fact that like something like this happens and then people actually do it. Right. That just blows my mind. So, second, but the re- the lesson for me here, and it just, just reminded me that like, you know, these missions that they build for planetary exploration are like, you know, they, they culminate over like decades. Right. And, and like one, and so they planned on the big, the number one item was like a, a spacecraft that would send to Uranus, right? Because they've never, they would orbit the planet. And there, and I think the estimate was that if everything went fine, it would launch sometime in the 2040s or 20, like late 2030s or something like that, I think. Wow. And it would not get there until the 2040s because it takes like a, probably 10 years to get there, you know? Um, I mean, just like just to be able to like think about a project on that scale, just it's just mind blowing to me. Right, right. It's on a massive spatial scale as well as temporal scale. Yeah, exactly. Like if I started on this project today, I would not. I would be retired by the time I got there, probably. Right, right. (laughs) You know, it's like, um, and many people might not even be alive. I think by the time it gets there, um, you know, who are working on this project, and it just I don't know, just that just like, and I think. But there's something to be said about that, I guess. I, I guess it's like, you know, uh, I think there's like the tendency, especially maybe in the health sciences, to kind of like want things sooner and faster. Um, and uh, but they're out those planetary scientists, they're out there, you know, working on deca- decade long scales. Do you think the health sciences, I mean, things feel more urgent because there's a health problem that you're trying to address now because there are people alive with that health problem now. Yes. And I may be missing something here, but, you know, sure, if we could in a year figure out, I don't know, how to go to Mars and set up some colony there, that might have immediate implications. But it's not like if we don't fly to Mars this year that, you know, the human species is going to be erased so there's a bit of urgency in terms of like whether there's a specific problem that is an immediate problem that you're trying to solve or whether it is sort of fundamental science that will um you know bear fruit or be available to solve a problem that may become acute you know decades from now is that making sense? Yeah, no. I mean, I think it it does make sense. And I think we've decided to prioritize people who are 
people's health now, right? Which I think makes sense, right? Like, I mean, it didn't have to be that way, but it makes, to me, it makes sense that it is, right? Right. Um, and, uh, and we have not decided to not prioritize, like, exploring the outer regions of the, you know, of the solar system, right? Um, and uh, so fine, like, you know, that's like, that's fine. But I think, um, and I'm not saying we should, like, slow down all of our research into, like, heart disease and cancer or whatnot. But um, I don't know, there might be some benefit to stepping back a little bit um, and thinking about how we could do things better. But I don't think we should necessarily, that's not, a, that's not a call to like, let's take our time and figure things out over the next 20 years. You know? <laughs> it must be a strange sort of funding scenario too. Although I'm thinking of this through a soft money lens and my guess is people who are involved in this are not on soft money. But if you were on soft money, on the one hand, you know, if you got your project to be a part of whatever, you know, agenda was being set and massive telescope was that was going to be built, you sort of would feel like you were set for like a 10 year period of your career potentially or longer. Right. I actually think it's worse. It's worse than being on soft money. Actually. It, it, or if you're not a part of it, what are you going to do? Well, there is that element. But I think like if you're uh, if you are a part of it, I think the problem is that these projects are so massive that there's not like it's not like there is a funding agency in charge of like funding these projects usually it's nasa or whatever but but because the projects are so big like they a, a, a appear as like individual line items in the budget and so because they are visible as like line items in the budget they could be cut by congress at any time right oh uh, because congress people are looking at these things like why do we need a spacecraft going to mars you know, what, right, you know right. <laughs> like whereas like your individual project is not like an, a line item in the budget, right? In the in the federal budget is what I'm talking about, right? So I, it's, there's a whole lot more visibility, uh, and and you have to satisfy your board. Now your like your external oversight committee has you know uh, 535 you know members of Congress on it, and so I think it is yes the money is there and we've decided to do it, but it could be gone at any time. And for example, one of the classic examples is the the Europa Clipper, uh, which is going to this moon called Europa. Um, was I think cut by like every, every the last three presidents <laughs> like, oh, like wow. their their kind of preliminary budget always cut this project out uh, but there was one con so this is kind of the opposite there was one congressman I can't remember which one maybe from I think from Texas actually um, who always put it back in the budget and so uh, it was always funded and that that's just the way it goes so like your project now becomes like a political football right right yeah no that's a fair point. All right, I'll, I'll stick with my soft money. <laughs> stick with your NIH grants, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, lesson there is that, I don't know, there's no lesson. There's no lesson. No. So, golf. Yes, what's the latest? So, the latest is I took a lesson from someone, from a different instructor. Oh, Okay. And this is apparently like a normal thing in golf. Like people will sometimes, I don't know, go on a golf vacation and that place offers lessons and you just take a lesson. And it feels weird to me. Like it feels like I'm cheating on like the person who, you know, had been my, you know, has been sort of my regular instructor. Yeah. But I was convinced it was a thing. And it was actually quite informative because... The approach that this person took, like like the approach of the different instructors are is totally different. Yeah. There were things that, you know, that were totally new in terms of like concepts of the golf swing or whatever that I had not absorbed, you know, with the other instructor. And I think it would have been vice versa if I'd gone in the other order. Um, and the other reason that I was a bit, kind of anxious about it is that you know, there's always this worry that so some people have this is completely ridiculous and I don't have this person some people have a swing coach which is a coach specifically to work on like the mechanics of your swing and there are all these details about like you know the angle of your wrists and this that and the I mean like they could dissect your swing movements down to like the nanosecond and each nanosecond like every single muscle in your body is supposed to be in a certain position. Like it's just out of control. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
So there is a worry that like someone will try to completely break down your swing and start all over again, uh, too, yeah. right? And so that's always anxiety provoking. And I, I don't, I, I don't want to say this because I'm afraid I might even jinx it, but um, I had a light bulb go off about one particular aspect of how I needed to be sort of moving my body during the swing. Okay. And I think that it it may prove to be very helpful in the long run. And, and that came about because you worked with this different person. I think so because one person's style was sort of. You go and show me how you hit the ball. And then they would make some suggestions, recommendations about how to sort of, you know, adjust things based on how you would normally go to try to hit the ball. And and the other person sort of uh, very much intellectualized all of the steps. And that was very helpful for me. Because And I don't know whether it's like, I'm just not like a natural, I mean, this is probably like way TMI for this entire podcast, but <laughs> I'm not like a just naturally coordinated athletic person, right? Uh -huh. And so I have to be like told and very like, put your foot here exactly five, you know what I'm saying? And like practice like that over and over again before it gets ingrained. And then I'm like learning and I'm now in my mid fifties so, so to try to learn this is anyway. So I think, it, I think it was helpful, but we'll have to stay tuned. There is a lesson in here somewhere. It's not just a golf update, by the way, I know you're wondering like what, what, what the heck does this have to do with anything? I'm dying to know. Well, this is, you know, there's always a reach because it's an excuse to talk about <laughs> like what's going on with golf. I think this is why you need multiple mentors, right? So if you're, I'm making this up, I'm using grant writing as, as, as an example, but if you keep writing grant after grant after grant and they're all not getting discussed, not getting discussed, not getting discussed, maybe it's time to sort of break the swing down, back down to the basics and start all over again. Retrain a bit and that requires retooling and it may require different mentors. It may require, um, you know, going and taking a grant writing boot camp. or, um, and I think sometimes we collectively don't kind of pause to sort of say, uh, we, we may pause to say, okay, what didn't go, go well with this particular academic product and how do we make the product better? But rarely do we pause and sort of say, okay, overall things are not going great. And so what is it that needs to be retooled in, in terms of like, you know, is it that my general approach to developing a research question needs to be reevaluated or my general way I approach grant writing or, you know, so, et cetera, et cetera. That's a good lesson. That was a good save. A good save that justified, like, you know, my, the retooling of my game. You know what got me thinking when you were talking about it, uh, you know, the, in, I feel like in music, it's similar in that you typically work with the same teacher, you know, all the time. Um, but then when you go, if you happen to like take a lesson from another teacher, you know, we call that a master class, right? Because uh -huh. um, often like some person will come by, you know, swing through town and like take on like three, four students, you know, in one time, you know, and, and then give them a, give them a lesson, you know, and then and then they're gone, right? And so you do like a so it, it sounds like it sounds good. So they're doing a master class, right? Oh, it's not the executive class. It's not exactly right. <laughs> and uh, and I think it is has it serves a very similar purpose in the sense that like you get a totally different perspective on your playing and your and and your technique and what they focus on versus what you typically focus on. And um, I think it's a and so it's useful to have that kind of different perspective. And I, back in the old days when I did play the violin, I remember I, remember I found it very useful um, because different people just care about different things, you know, and so um, they will just point out different things. Um, so, and I feel like in academia, we kind of do that. I guess, you know, you don't always do it if you're like a student, for example, like you'll be working with your advisor and, uh, and that might be it. But if you have like a group or something like that, you might do like a group presentation or, or you might do like a presentation 
in your department or something, and then you and that's kind of like a chance to get feedback from other people. Uh, but I find that sometimes that doesn't always happen, and I think it's it's worse when it doesn't. Right. Well, and I think sometimes it's about a like a specific product rather than sort of like what's what's your overall approach to your game right it's not like a, your general technique at doing science or something like that right yeah, right that's true right yeah all right so main topics yeah what are the main topics for today have you heard about this new data sharing initiative from nih uh i have not no i uh surprisingly i did not hear about it <laughs> so it is um supposed to help it's supposed to be a step towards addressing the irre- irre- reproducibility crisis. <laughs> you can't even <laughs> reproduce the word. No. Yeah. I should just call it the reproducibility crisis. But the uh, ar- the article we're linking to is a Nature article, and uh, they put the ear in front of the reproducibility crisis. So, in a nutshell, there's a new policy. It's supposed to go into effect. Um, I think next January. And all NIH applications for projects that collect scientific data, which has not been defined, must include a data management and sharing plan, which you have to have a data sharing plan right now, but the plan has to contain details about the software or tools needed to analyze the data, when and where the raw data will be published, and any special considerations for accessing or distributing that data. You know, it's still not entirely crystallized in my mind what this means, but um, I think there are concerns about, you know, the costs of doing this. Um, And so, uh, and the resources, right? So if you had a service centrally at your institution that would um, take, you know, your raw data sets and annotate them appropriately and take your code that you use to, you know, generate the data for your primary paper and annotate it and, you know, house it someplace that was publicly accessible. Like, I think that's what it would take. And I think the other piece of this that was sort of implied, but not explicit, at least in this Nature article, is I thought that this also tells you a lot about well, so when I read this, I was like, but you always have to manage data when you collect it, right? I mean, so there's extra overhead, but maybe it's not as much as people think. And then I sort of backtracked as I was thinking and reading this article, oh, the the degree of data management that people are doing is probably not the degree that is ideal anyway to start out with, whether or not it was going to be, you know, shared, Um and so this may be a forcing mechanism, right, to... Get people to clean up their act. Yes. I mean, and I don't mean that. It is really hard to do good data management. And yeah. um, there's someone I'm working with on um, a project, and she's using data from a study that we completed and um, some of the biospecimens and... So I sent her our code book and she made a comment to me like she's never gotten a data set like this with this code book and how well annotated it was and so on and so forth. And it was just a reminder that, you know, we had resources to do that, but it's really hard to do and it's really time intensive. And I think the vast majority of people, right, you write a grant, there's limited budget. A lot of times you don't explicitly budget for data management. It's implied that research assistants will do it. And then you only get the data managed to the bare minimum that you need it managed in order to create, you know, the first scholarly product. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, but there ha- you've been required to do a data management and sharing plan if, if your project was over a certain budget, right? I had thought that you always had to have a data sharing plan. No, but, I think you didn't have no? to do it if it was under 250000 250, Oh, so my budgets, yeah. So I... Yeah. Put, but. What has been appropriate is sort of saying, you know, uh, we will accept requests for people to access the data. And if it's scientifically valid and we can protect PHI, uh, then we will put together an agreement with, you know, the requester to share the data. Like, it doesn't say much more than that. 
Right, but now they have to like you have to make it publicly available. Right, right, and and you need to describe, I think, in much more detail about. Like I imagine what they want, but I don't know whether this is enforceable, which was another point of this article, is they would want something like I described, right? Where there's this code book that lists all the variables and the type of, you know, whether they're continuous or blah, 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 and what the coding means and so on and so forth. You know, that there's a study protocol that's made available along with it. Like any, Like you could tie up a packet and anyone could you know, take that information you gave them and they could reproduce the analyses, you know, that informed the first paper or they could do their own analysis. And I, I think the current data sharing plan falls way short of that. Right, yeah. I think so. There are definitely going to have to be more details in the data sharing plan uh, than you might normally have had in the past. And I think that's probably good. It does force you to think about it. Um I think you know some of the comments in the in the Nature article are along the lines of like this is a good start, but it's only a start, right? Because having the policy is, I think it sends a good message, but it it doesn't. You can't assume that it's just going to work out. And I think some of the issues are that, you know, what happens after the grant is done? Like, there's no funding to like maintain any of this, right? Um, and so I think the life the life cycle for a data set is remarkably short. I think. Um, especially if it's kind of data set that requires like software to access, you know, like or to understand or interpret, um, that software will, can go out of date and very quickly. Um, and so I think that's, I think the, the idea, the general idea of like maintenance of this kind of stuff is never really considered, um, and it's always bugged me. Um, but it's a huge amount of cost. And like, what if someone has a question for you about that data set? Like, are you funded to answer that question? What if? A thousand people have a question for that data set. Or do you have to answer all thousand? You know, um, and uh, it's. The, I think so. These are the kinds of things that will have to be worked out, and I'm sure someone's thinking about it. But it's there. It's a challenge, I think. So get all your grants submitted now. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I and the, well. So the other thing I would say is that, like, I, you know, you and I, we've been on projects where there was barely enough money budgeted for data analysis, right? Right. Um, much less like. Fund, finding some funding to like set up an infrastructure or set up infrastructure for like data sharing, right? Um, and so I'm just I'm not I'm worried that like there's I mean you gotta squeeze one more thing out of that budget. Where's that money gonna come from? It's probably gonna come from data analysis, right? It's not gonna come out of data collection, right? Right. Uh, and so where's that money gonna come from? It's it's coming out of analysis for sure. Uh, and on top of the fact that you know people make this point all the time that. Um, the size of sort of the typical R01 has not changed, I think, in several decades, if I'm over right. Over 20 years, I think, over 20 years. Right. Yeah. Um, but meanwhile, you know, so the dollar, the equivalent of 250000 you know, dollars in today was like, I'm making this up, but like under $200,000 20 years ago. It's, it's, there's a sizable, you know, difference. And so you're being asked to do more on less dollars, essentially. Yeah, I think the calculation is roughly like, I think in 2000 or two, or whatever, early 2000 when the budget, you know, the cap was set, uh, you know, like the equivalent now would be like about 750000 I think, relative to like a $500,000 grant. Um, so, I mean, imagine having an extra two fifty; dollars it could make a difference, right? Yeah, and like every project now has is like super interdisciplinary, so you have to have a lot of investigators on there, and it's just um, you know. So like in principle, the policy is fine. It, you know, who knows where the money's coming? I've been in conversations with NIH officials where I'm like, "There's no money to pay for data sharing, right?" And they're like, "You can do whatever you want with the budget. Just make this, you know, budget some money for data sharing." And I'm like, "Well, that's not exactly." <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. No, I'm serious. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, there is like a pie. I, I didn't go into the whole pie chart with them, but. <laughs> the, the pie chart? There's a, not I, just a time pie, there's uh, a money pie. Yeah, I was tempted to draw like a little pie and like, you know, move the triangles around and stuff. But um, yeah, I, mean, I think their perspective is basically like, you have a budget, you can do whatever you want with it. And so it's like, well, yeah. Anyway, so the other thing, the other question I have is to what extent data sharing specifically will help with like reproducibility. I don't know. I mean, 
I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see exactly what the mechanism would be for improving the reproducibility of science. I think, except if, like you said, it somehow forces people to like manage data better, right? Because they're going to have to come up with some plan. Uh, but if like the money for that comes out of like analyzing data well, I like I see that it's kind of like <laughs> I think like you know it would kind of offset each other. So I don't see exactly what the mechanism is for improving the reproducibility of science. I'm all for it on a transparency and accountability basis. I think, but you know I think it's a it's, it might be a wash for improving the reproducibility of science. Well, fasten your seatbelt because you know this this may be the future. And well, it is well, the future, right? And then I mean, you put you yeah. put the and then uh, you got to put someone in charge of the data management and sharing plan. And the logical person is the biostatistician. <laughs> well, uh, I think I'm going to get out of the business of collecting data. That's the easiest solution, right? Get out of the business of collecting data. Yeah. So you don't collect data. Well, stop being involved with people who collect data. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait, 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 wait. Are you breaking up with me on this episode? Well, it depends on who's doing the data management plan. You just said you may never. Okay, well, this podcast may go poof, apparently. <laughs> the podcast doesn't involve any data, so that's fine. No, but you said you wouldn't be involved with people who did primary <laughs> data collection, I believe. <laughs> I'm just saying I have alternatives, you know. All right. I hear you. Duly noted. <laughs> Let me ask you, I want to ask you this, though. Like, do you think this solves the reproducibility crisis? No. Okay. What problem do you think it solves? Let me ask you that. As I've sort of gotten older, <laughs> I, th I think that the, I mean, there's always trade-offs and plus and pluses and minuses. I think the pluses of, of these sorts of initiatives are that they um, may raise the you know quality like you said of data management or what have you that the, it's an educational tool in some sense right if people like pay attention to it which is like oh i need to create this plan let me go find someone who's written a plan and not everyone but some people when they read someone else's plan you know that was accepted by the nih they're like wow am i supposed to be doing all of this yes um and so that's um that might be what it might accomplish. Okay. I can see that. I, can, I would agree with that, actually. Yeah, not that much different from what you said. Yeah. Okay. Weekly grind? Yes. So, you know what I did? What'd you do? I submitted my NIH progress report. <laughs> How much time did you spend on it? Uh, I did not spend... Okay, so there's like the part of the NIH progress report that's like actually writing about the progress that you've made, right? I think it's like section B, right? Um, that did not take super long. It was the first year, you know, it wasn't like, there wasn't a ton. Um, so that didn't take long, <laughs> like all the other sections. First of all, I haven't like actually done this in a while. Um, and so I'd forgotten about all the other sections. Plus there's like more sections now. So like all the other parts where you had to like collect people's other support, that took way longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the administrative piece. <laughs> All that stuff took like days, whereas like actually writing about my progress took like an hour, I think. My weekly grind is um, I helped coordinate a mock study section and served as the chair. Excellent. And you were you were there. You served as a reviewer. I thought it went well. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So I think... That's a wrap. You can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter, Twitter handle is at the effort report and our email address is the effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening.